Welcome to this morning's session. I see there's already a good 30. Good morning, good morning. I see there's morning. Hello everyone. I see there's quite a number of uh, participants. Um, most of them, yes. Um, then let's say welcome um, everybody, perhaps we can start recording. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody to the second session of our, our lecture series. Today, um, Louise Ravelli is with us, you can see her already. Uh, Louise works at the School of Arts and Media at the University of New South Wales. She's actually very far from us, but with us digitally. <laughs> um, Louise has a PhD from the University of Birmingham, UK, uh, and has been communications consultant to the Australian Museum and the Museum of Contemporary Art Australia. So um, we start seeing that she has an important academic career, but she's also had an important uh, contact with the professional world of museums. Uh, she serves as an editor for the journal Visual Communication. Her research expertise include multimodal communication, museum communication, discourse analysis and spatial discourse analysis, and systemic functional grammar uh, using uh, um, frameworks such as systemic functional grammar, social semiotics, multimodal discourse analysis, she has also contributed to academic writing studies um, with reference to uh, the arts and especially to spatial discourse analysis. She has authored and authored a number of books and numerous uh, publications. Um, let me just uh, list three. Museum Texts, Communication Frameworks, 2006, which was also a set book at the University of Modena for a while, um, when I taught <laughs> in the uh, arts programme. Um, doctoral Writing in the Creative and Performing Arts, 2014, and Multimodality in the Built Environment, Spatial Discourse Analysis. Today, she's actually giving us an introduction to spatial discourse analysis in relation to the built environment. Louise, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Mm, thank you, Marina. Okay, uh, saluto, benvenuti a tutti. Sono così contenti di essere qui, anche se a solo virtualmente. Grazie alla organizzatori per avermi invitato e assicurato che qualcosa accada e forse a un certo punto in futuro possiamo incontrarci faccia a faccia. No, non parlo italiano, ma capisco un po' e ho chiesto a mio figlio che ha studiato italiano a scuola di tradurlo per me. Quindi il resto del discorso sarà in, in inglese, ma volevo solo salutarlo in questo modo. Quindi in inglese allora. That was probably dreadful, but I just did want to say hello in Italian. I know you are all very sophisticated with your English. And I'm a fairly typical monolingual Australian uh, with some French and um, little bits of other languages behind me, but not much else. So uh, thank you, Marina, for your warm introduction. I hope you're all well and all surviving this crazy year. So <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to do an introduction to spatial discourse analysis today. And uh, we're going to look uh, at two texts. I will introduce one which came from one of the pre-readings, if you had a chance to look at that. If not, you can look at that after after the class and then the Enzo Ferrari Museum for Modena. Um, if I could ask you to turn your cameras off while I'm speaking, I think most of you have, uh, and your microphones, of course. However, if something goes wrong, you know, maybe uh, the signal freezes or you simply can't hear me, then 
please turn your microphone and camera on and just talk over me because I think that's the only way you can make yourself heard on Zoom is you have to talk over the participants. So we normally wouldn't do that, but um, if there is a problem, uh, please do do that. Um, at a few points in the session today, I'm going to uh, try and use the breakout rooms um, and get you to work together in some small groups uh, on a few analyses. And um, there'll be a chance to ask questions on the way. So just turn your microphone on again and your camera um, when, it, when uh, it's time to ask questions. And I'll make a full copy of the slides available after the workshop. Uh, there might be a couple of points where you want to screenshot the slide as we go, um, but otherwise I'll give you a copy afterwards. Okay, so to start with, uh, now, uh, first problem, I'm just going to see if I can switch to my whiteboard. No, uh, that's not going to work. Okay, so um, <clears throat> seems like I can't use the whiteboard when I'm in full screen mode. Let's try. Uh, okay, sorry. <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> first adjustment, so I won't be doing the whiteboard, but I understand that you are from a variety of areas of Italy and a variety of disciplinary backgrounds, humanities, education, ICT. So um, I won't presume too much background. Some of you may have a very strong background in some of the things I'm saying. Some of you may never have heard of it before. So hopefully we can find a middle path and um, see how we go with that. Okay, so first of all, multimodality in the built environment, which is the main thing I'm trying to introduce today. So there's quite a long history of working um, on the built environment, on buildings and so on, and public spaces, uh, particularly in the social semiotic tradition. Uh, Chris and Von Lewin uh, starting this notably in the first edition of their Reading Images book, which will this year come out in the third edition, which is um, very interesting. Um, myself, if I may say so, in 2000, I analysed a shop that was built in Sydney at the time of the Sydney Olympics, which is exactly 20 years ago. We were only last week or the week before celebrating the 20th anniversary. And perhaps you can see um, that the floor of this um, shop here, the interior of the shop, looks like the floor of a swimming pool. And up here are the um, diving spots, you know, where the, the top of the pool where people dive in. So, sorry. This, um, this building uh, used a whole bunch of devices in a very interesting way to communicate different uh, ideas and thoughts about um, the Olympic Games, particularly in Sydney. Uh, Michael O'Toole has uh, done interesting analyses of the built environment, including of the Sydney Opera House. And uh, Marie Stenglin uh, did a very interesting PhD looking particularly at interiors and how they might make us feel sort of comfortable or uncomfortable in different ways. So uh, uh, there might be a, a dark space that is uh, small and dark, which might make you feel cozy or it might make you feel claustrophobic. Or there could be a light, big open space, which makes you feel sort of free or it might make you feel scared. So, um, not a simple correlation between a particular environment and a particular response, but a very interestingly explained um, response to different environments. Okay, so my most recent work has been with Robert McMurtry, who was a graduate student of mine, and we developed what we call spatial discourse analysis in our 2016 book. So here we take a social semiotic metafunctional approach and we applied that approach to the analysis of a number of buildings, um, some apartments, a university library, um, uh, an historic building in Sydney, which is now a shopping centre and an art gallery located in a former warehouse in Sydney. So we took a, a, what we call a metafunctional approach. 
uh, and that is looking at different kinds of meaning. And for the purposes of the book, we, we uh, dedicated particular chapters to each metafunction, but in practice, these all work together. So isolating them is just a heuristic to sort of make the analysis manageable. Um, and we, as I said, we highlighted it in particular chapters, but all of these metafunctions go together. So the metafunctions are essentially different types of meaning, different ways of understanding meaning, really. So representational meanings, which we uh, use to look at some apartment blocks, is about, or for that particular chapter, was about what it meant to live in those kinds of places that we were looking at there. And I'll say more about each of these metafunctions in a moment. Interactional meaning is another metafunction, and here we were looking at how um, elements of the design of the building created particular relations between the library and its users, and what it means to be a student in the library and the university. So interactional meanings are about how um, users interact and users and communicative texts interact. Organisational meaning is how the whole text holds together and in relation to this particular shopping centre we were looking at how uh, sort of patterns of similarity and difference were counterbalanced throughout this um, shopping centre and it sort of enabled the merging of an egalitarian approach to the space enabling people to access anywhere but also with an evident social stratification so clearly um, some parts of this centre are more exclusive than others and that's marked in design terms but also counterbalanced with other things that make it open. And there is a fourth meta function about relational meaning so I'm not going to talk about this one today but this is about more sort of a logical organisation of spaces. Okay, so for spatial discourse analysis um, we analyse the spatial texts of which buildings are one component. Spatial texts are thus more fully the synthesis of building, space, content and user. We examine both the built structure, its overall form and space, what is put inside and outside the building and how it is used by people. The aim is to understand how spatial texts make meaning and contribute to socially constructed knowledges. So it is about the buildings but it's also about how the buildings um, uh, work with the user, with what is put inside the building, with its relation to the environment and so on, and how all that uh, comes together. Um, and, and what we're particularly interesting is, is that last point there, how it makes meaning and contributes to socially constructed knowledges. So this is, as I said, a social semiotic approach where we consider communication to be shaped by social context and that there are explicit links between material resources and meaning. So it's not a case of just looking at a building and saying, you know, how it makes you feel. We kind of do do that, but you have to be able to pin your response to a specific feature, you know, a particular material that is used or a particular shape and so on. So this is a very uh, core element of social semiotic approaches to language, to other communicative resources, and we have adopted that in our spatial discourse analysis as well. Another element of this perspective of this approach is that you have to have sort of multiple lenses on at the same time. So as well as thinking about different met functions, if we are looking at buildings, we are first of all, we look at them almost as if it's a still two dimensional picture, whether that be from the exterior or the interior, we can look at it, you know, as an object, so to speak. But of course, being about buildings, it is about the three dimensions and we really have to imagine being inside the building or moving around it, moving up, moving down, moving uh, through the building and so on. So that is really important. And I think as in so much, um, well, just to, to bring this quote in from McMurtry, he's from his own book, um, we can experience space in two fundamental ways, configurationally or serially. Configurationally, we experience the space from a stationary position, absorbing all the visual information in one static take. Serially, in contrast, we move through the space, gleaning the visual information and unpacking it into multiple dynamic takes. 
So that's just a more elegant way of saying what I said before. You know, we can look at it in the two dimensions or experience it uh, in the three dimensions. Another element, and I think this is distinctive of all social semiotic work in relation to any communicative entity, is that we have to place things in their social context. So, for example, for uh, this particular building, which is now a shopping centre, we need to consider its um, historical origins, the, its original function, which was actually as a, a market hall, and its relation to other um, uh, great buildings of the city of Sydney at the time when it was built. And of course, we need to consider it in its contemporary location as well. It now sits in the middle of the CBD. Um, it's surrounded by contemporary buildings and busy streets. So lots of things change as a result of that. So always thinking about where things sit in relation to uh, history is, is Im important in, in bringing some insights to the analysis. Another feature, a little bit like looking at it uh, in, in different ways, you know, the, the two-dimensional or the three-dimensional, we have to think about these buildings in terms of different sizes or parts. You know, more formally, this is called rank. Informally, we, we might think of this as layers. So some of the things we say, some of our observations might be about the building as a whole, you know. So um, if you know Cresson von Leeuwen's um, uh, analysis of the ideal and real where in in space on the vertical dimension things that are up high have value of um, the ideal a promise something uh, an essence of something things that are real are down low the more concrete they are so in relation to the building as a whole we can see that the clock here is suspended from the ceiling it's very high down here on the bottom floor it's a more concrete experience. So the clock is um, very elaborate. Uh, tourists come and watch this clock on the hour when uh, little uh, characters perform and so on. Um, and it seems to symbolize something of what this shopping center now stands for, you know, the historic values and so on. And yet down here, uh, much more concrete things are happening. People are having a coffee, uh, walking through to the train station which is underneath and so on. So that's something we might say at the rank of the building. But we could also think about this phenomenon of ideal real in terms of um, the levels of the store of the centre in relation to each other. So we have one level here, another here, another here. So we perhaps get a kind of a serial relation, you know, down here is the real in relation to this level, which then becomes um, uh, the real, sorry, that my touch, touch pad is very sensitive. Um, it, it, so ideal here in relation to real here, but then ideal here in relation to, so we did it again, real down there. So um, we can think about the ideal real in relation to the levels. And we can also think about it in relation to one floor. So here we have um, the sign of the shop, the name of the shop up high before we enter. And yet the door that we enter through is, as Chris and Von Leeuwen say, in the space of the real. So um, it's just saying here that we need to think about whether we are talking about um, the whole building and which bit of it we are focusing on. Is it the building as a whole? A floor or a room within it or perhaps something within that room and so on. So it's like layers within layers. Okay, now the terms I'll be using today come from um, uh, Ravelli and McMurtry, but there is um, uh, their origins really are in Halliday's work on language in systemic functional linguistics. And these terms and the approach being adapted by Chris and von Leeuwen in their analysis of reading images. And um, these are the ones we'll be looking at today, representational, interactional and organisational, the three uh, meta functions that we'll focus on. And as I said, we won't be looking at the relational today. 
So there are some very important rules with spatial discourse analysis. The first one is that you must have physically ex visited or experienced the text. There is no point analysing something that you can only look at in pictures because the experience is always different from the pictures. So that's a really important rule. The second rule is very occasionally you can break that rule. Um, so I'm going to break that rule today. Um, I want to analyse the Enzo Ferrari Museum in Modena um where i haven't been but i'm hoping some of you have been there and uh, will be able to add some insights for us to the analysis we we start off today if you do break the rule and you're analyzing something based on pictures and um, video perhaps then you have to really make an effort to make sure you're analyzing the space the three-dimensional space, not the two-dimensional image of the space, okay? So that is different for, to analyze a photograph from a space, even though I did say we can like look at these things. Um, but you really need to put yourself in, in the space of being there and moving around through that space. Okay. All right, so um, I'll, I'm going to, to exemplify some of the analyses in relation to the Museum of Portuguese Language from Sao Paulo, Brazil, which I did visit some years ago. Uh, very tragically, um, this truly wonderful museum burnt down some years ago. They are still in the process of rebuilding. You can see there on the left that it's located in what was a train station and um, as noted in, in the article that was in the pre-reading, this is an incredibly, or was, an incredibly popular uh, museum, always with queues outside waiting to get in. It really um, spoke to the people of Brazil and particularly of the city of Sao Paulo and uh, drew visitors in. It's kind of every museum curator's dream to have those kind of visitor numbers. So um, I'll just talk about this very briefly, but basically this museum is on three levels and the photographs you see now are on the first level, which is a, a, a temporary exhibition space. So this was, um, I think it was the opening exhibition. I might be wrong about that, but I think it was the opening exhibition of the museum. And um, it was incredibly dynamic and interactive. It was all about a particular book that is extremely um, uh, important and resonant in Brazilian culture. It's a little bit like, you know, a Shakespeare text for the UK or something like that. Um, and um, there are extracts of the book up high, in fact, drafts, you can see edits there, and you would pull on the string, pull them down to see them. You would look through little glasses to see an element of text, sort of, um, uh, be able to visualize it properly or use a mirror here in the water to see something which you you can't see without the mirror so it was a very interactive exhibit really um, innovative and interesting the second level of the museum you can see from these pictures it's more immediately conventional in terms of what we are familiar with in terms of museum practice um, uh, this level is more about, this is a permanent part of the museum and it's about the history um, of the language, its origins, its varieties and so on. So as you enter, on the left this is like a video wall and lots of these videos, there's one here, one here, one here, they um, sort of unfold almost like a tr train running along this line here and each has its own sort of music and sound going with it so a very dynamic interaction uh, on an, the opposite wall is a timeline which gives the historical origins and in the center of the space are these pillars which give various forms of in information and there are some other elements uh, in on this floor as well um, but behind um, behind these elements not in exactly in the same space here and then the top level um, these photographs don't really capture at all what it's like but it's like a planetarium so it's a big dark room uh, the visitors sit around the edge and and when the um, the show what is what it is really is playing then you can't see any of the other visitors they're really black uh, and then what is projected on the ceiling are extracts of um, of 
poetry, of famous texts, of well-known Brazilian voices, of uh, political speeches and so on. And these move all over the ceiling um, in various shapes, dynamic lighting, incredible sound, a really immersive experience. So you can just see from this that the three levels of the museum each offer really different forms of engagement. Um, with the visitor and different forms of representation about what language is and they're all organized in their own particular way. Okay and so the second text is the Museo Enzo Ferrari in Modena. So um, uh, I hope some of you have been there. I'm going to um, play their introductory video first of all. It takes three minutes so we will watch it all. I think it's important to see it all and then uh, we'll come back to analyze it. So, um, yeah, what we're going to do now is what I said before, a very basic step, which is to just describe. So if you could all just take a minute and jot down a few sentences or dot points that describe the space, uh, what you, you know from being there or what you just remember from the video. Okay, so honestly, 60 seconds if you can.
okay. Now, if I could invite you to, um, I think you should be able to draw something on the whiteboard. So, um, uh, using the little the little text option, um, you can just write anywhere on the board. Maybe if you could share some of the your observations of this space. Okay, many lights. Yes, it's very bright, isn't it? Subtle decoration. Can you can you just write a little bit more what you mean by subtle decoration? Ah, oh, you can't use it. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, well, I think the observation, it's interesting what people do and don't observe though. So that, you know, um, subtle decoration, maybe, maybe that it's, mo it's predominantly a white space and smooth surfaces. There is some decoration um, with some lines on the floor. Yeah. Flattened dome. Nice. It is impressive, isn't it? And it has a sense of being international. Yes, it's not, um, it's not a specific geographical location. Um, geographically separated, uh, that perhaps means um, uh, the way they move through the countries London, or cities, London, Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, and so on. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, all right, let's stop there. That's, that's enough. Um, stop share. Just each time I have to go back through this, I have learned. Okay, so a, a starting point. So there are perhaps more things that you could add there and um, different people do notice different things. So it's always good to revisit a text just for that basic description. Okay, let's start with representational meaning then. I've already done that. Um, uh, and an important thing here is that when we do an analysis, it needs to be based on explicit or observable features of the text. So for representational meaning, we're interested in the material reality of um, the communicative text. And in terms of the built environment, we're asking what a space is and what it is for. We look at what is denoted, what is actually there, and what is connoted by that, perhaps through the materials that are used or the shapes that are used, for example. And perhaps something in the design or what is there in terms of content might indicate particular functions of the space or how it should be used. So if there are chairs, then that perhaps suggests that uh, people can sit. You know, it's a, perhaps an obvious thing, but an important one to note. And in terms of thinking about being in the text, we look at the processes. So um, uh, who or what are the key participants in the text? So this may include people and things. So we will have visitors in this space um, uh, moving through it, but obviously also there are, there are the cars. So what's, what are the key participants in the space? And there are other, what I would call participants in this space as well. And then we want to identify what actions are enabled for those participants? Uh, do they sit, do they move, or is it maybe static? And um, it's important to ask if all interactants can act in the same way. Okay, so these are the sorts of questions that we ask. While I'm, I put these questions here in very general terms, the actual analysis is based on um, something more detailed and explicit. So um, McMurtry and I have worked from Chris and von Lohen's approach to images about process types and applied that to buildings as well. And the, the main thing to think about here is the split between narrative and conceptual processes. So basically the narrative processes are dynamic ones where things move. So um, uh, uh, walking, sitting, uh, a car, driving along the road and so on. Conceptual processes are largely static where we look at something for what it is rather than what it does. Okay, so that's really the main division you need to think about for today. 
So in the uh, language museum, and I'll just talk about level two um, uh, to keep it a bit more simple and also because that's the one that's most obviously a museum there. So what do we have in this space? So um, general impressions, first of all, it's fairly dark. Um, the, uh, it has fairly dark colours and, and fairly uh, subtle, dark, subdued lighting. There's a lot of written text there, a number of images and maps, videos. There's a game in a slightly separate room and so on. And what is denoted here is particular knowledge about language through the maps, for example, and um, language as an experience. Uh, so on the video, we see songs and poems and so on. And together, I think this is connoting something like legitimacy or the seriousness of the language, the validity of the language. So denotation and connotation are both really fairly woolly concepts. Uh, it's just a starting point to help you think about what's in the space. It's not really the full analysis. So the visitor in this particular level of the museum, uh, they can watch, they can look, they can read and listen, and they can also play with this particular game in another room. And language as a participant in this level is construed as the sum of where it comes from through its historical origins and its um, uh, unfolding through time. It's also construed as part of everyday experience and as a living thing, which is spoken, sung and written by everyday people. And it's construed as something fun because you can play a game with it. Okay, so that's a tiny bit of analysis there. And then the third task, so after describing and then analyzing, a really important step is to envisage how this text could be different. And uh, another way of calling that is the commutation test. Um, uh, yeah, so this step can be done along with the analysis and it helps you to see what is going on. So you look at what's there and then imagine, well, there, there would be another way of, uh, of shaping this building, of putting different things inside it. And if I can imagine another way, what does that tell me about what is already there? So in the language museum, because there are three levels and they're also different, that really helps us with this computation test. So level one, which is the very active one, it construes language as something that only comes alive when it is interacted with. Um, and it does other jobs as well, but it really, you, the visitor has absolutely got to be uh, an active agent in the process of making the language come alive. So in the, the water tank here with something written underneath, it's in reverse script. So it, you can't read it unless you hold the mirror up to it. Okay. On level three, which is like the planetarium, it construes language as something immersive and inherently symbolic of cultural values. The visitors are senses here, they can only watch and hear, and possibly also circumstances, they're positioned um, in the periphery, not central to the symbolic process of language itself, which is what is displayed um, orally and visually on the ceiling of the, of the room there. So each level construes language in quite different ways and creates a different representation of language, even though it's the same language in each case. All right, so um, with my fingers crossed, I'm gonna try to put you in breakout groups for, for a little activity now. So I'll randomly assign you to a small group uh, once you're in the groups, it's a little bit like being lost in space. You will be on your own. I may be able to drop in and out of some of them, but perhaps not. If there's a problem, um, uh, you can uh, send me a message in the chat function. I'll leave you in here for um, probably more like five to seven minutes rather than 10 minutes, just to keep on top of time. And I'd like you, as first thing, is to nominate one person to take notes and um, report back a few observations for the group, okay? Um, we probably won't get through all of the groups each time, but we'll just try and listen to one or two. So I'd like you to have a go at analyzing the Ferrari Museum in representational terms. What would you say this space is for? What is denoted and connoted? Don't get too caught up in that, but use that as a starting point. What functions and uses are indicated? 
what are the key human and non-human participants, uh, what processes or activities are enabled for these participants, and what does all of that say about the museum. All right, so you, you, might, you, you might not be able to address all of those things in the time, you might focus on one or two things, but um, as time is short, just um, uh, when I've put you in the group, just a quick hello and nominate your person and then just get into a discussion, okay? So cross fingers, everyone. Where are my breakout groups? <sighs> Sorry, just give me a second. Hmm. Okay. Uh, this is not working. I did have them before, but now I can't see where the breakout groups are. If anyone knows which button I should be looking for, please turn your microphone on and tell me. Uh, hmm. Okay. All right, that's a shame. Okay, I'll um, just have to have a think about that. Um, all right, let's go back to the screen. Okay, the breakout groups, no, I don't, can't find them at the moment. Okay, so um, sorry about that. Uh, all right, could you just take a minute or two on your own? See what you think you can say about representational meaning. You know, if this is the first time you've ever heard about it, then um, it's going to be a bit challenging, but some of you might have more experience, and I think just make your impression. So what we're trying to identify here is not everything about the museum, but um, uh, what this is about, right? What is this about? And on what basis can we identify what it's about, okay? Denotation, connotation, functions and uses, participants and their activities. So take a minute or two um, to uh, just write down some notes about that. And while you're doing that, I'm going to um, stop sharing the screen and see if I can find the all important breakout room button. Okay, all right, so I'll, I'll call you back in a couple of minutes.
Okay, so um, I'll get you to stop there and now uh, invite the brave ones. Uh, if anyone um, uh, has a comment to make about representational meaning here, um, now's the time if you can turn your, your camera and your audio on and make a comment. Um, uh, one or two of you might talk at the same time, but we'll work that out as we go. So um, what are your observations about this space in terms of representational meaning, first of all? Is anyone brave enough? Hi, Marta. Hi. <laughs> of, uh, the creators regarding the representational level is to give this idea of something special, of something unique, and of course of something, um, how I can say, out of the space, out, out of the real space, okay? Mm -hmm. um, considering the form of the building and considering the form of the interior, if we speak on the micro level, then uh, considering uh, how I can say the single participants, one of them, of course, is the interior, which is um, how I can say um, context, okay? Then uh, the second uh, participant, of course, is um, are the cars, which are the, uh, how I can say, the super stimulus, okay, of all the situation. And then, of course, uh, the most important, probably, of the participants is the visitor, which actually makes um, the storytelling active, the text real. And um, if you ask me, I think that actually, um, uh, how I can say, um, well, the, the real reading of the situation is actually the movement of the visitor inside. And I think that the idea of the creator is uh, to put us in an experience of, um, how I can say, um, of, a, of a racing track. Because if you consider all uh, inside situation and all the organization of the interior, actually all the cars are leveled and are exposed as being on a racing track, uh, I've been in the museum, it's obvious. <laughs> and um, uh, I think that the movement of the visitor, which is slower than the one of a racing car, of course, mm -hmm. it's like to have um, an experience on a slow motion, okay? It's like to have, um, it's like to have a very strong experience but, um, as reading it not mm. being inside a bit, okay? Mm. So we have a kind of a, um, how can I say, um, a mirroring mechanism, okay? I'm in it, I'm immersed in it, but uh, with my times, with my capacities, physical capacities, of course. So mm. I think that this is the idea of the museum. Mm, lovely, thank you so much. I don't know your name and you've come up just as a number, so. <laughs> <laughs> I can't use your name, but that's really interesting. It's, not, it's quite complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, it's great that you've been there as well. Um, yeah, so I think you, you've picked up there on the two levels, you know, the building as a whole. And I, I have seen the images of it from above, you know. Um, the idea is to be, um, well, of the, of the building, the idea of the building is to represent uh, how I can say um, the... Um, first part of the car basically mm -hmm. the bonnet this is something they thought about that actually oh, okay that's very the interesting interior part of the car oh, okay, I, don't, okay. I don't know the technical term of it but yeah i don't know much about cars either and then the micro the the cars and the visitor the visit i like what you're saying there about the visitors got to activate the story and that they're um, their temporal dimension is different from a typical racetrack where the cars are going very fast and normally um, 
both those cars are very fast and also very expensive and exclusive and the ordinary person normally doesn't have access to them. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll uh, go back to the screen share and a few things that I have noticed there, um, which you may or may not agree with and which might be wrong because I haven't been there. Okay, so... Uh, so, you know, the general observations about the space, we don't need to go through that. White, curvy, spacious, shiny. Um, the curves seem to me reminiscent of the general design of the Ferrari. You know, it's generally a curvy car. And um, as you were just saying, the opulence and, and luxury. What can the visitor do? They can walk and look and read and imagine. And in terms of processes, the people, they walk through the space, look at the cars, look and read the info panels and follow this sort of, seems to me that there's a trajectory on the floor, kind of a timeline or sequence that is followed. Um, for those of you who've been there, you might know if that's the case, or perhaps it might be a little bit more open and less directed than that. So the visitor can engage in dynamic processes here, but they're not very agentive. So the visitor can walk around, um, uh, but they can't really touch. They're gonna, maybe they can reach out and touch the car, but they're not really invited to touch the car. And there's nothing um, in the video, at least, which shows that the visitor can hop in and, and pretend to drive the car. There's none of that. And I think it's interesting that the cars are static and in place. They themselves don't move. So in Crescent von Leeuwen's terms, we would say they were the carriers of attributes, the attributes being their style, features, and so on. And each car is also symbolic um, uh, because they're out of place. They're not on a racing track. They're in a showroom. They're highlighted by being placed on those pedestals and being shiny in relation to the white walls and so on. So, um, and when you think of the cars all together, so not one car that you're looking at, but the, all of the cars in this space, then we might analyze this as an unstructured analytical process. Um, and that's, there's no taxonomy, no symmetry, but I think as the previous speaker was saying, possibly um, a temporal process that these cars, you know, we're meant to see them sort of progressing, not perhaps as cars on a racetrack, but as the evolution of the Ferrari over time. Okay, so that's just a few impressions there. Okay, so alternatives. You know, I think it's interesting in this white shiny space that evokes a car uh, racetrack. It's very clean, very clean. You know, I, I don't know much about car racing, but I think racetracks are probably pretty dirty. Um, and this is pretty clean. So they're not presenting anything like a really realistic uh, presentation of the racetrack, which would make it quite different. Um, the cars could be arranged in quite different ways. Why not group them according to color? Okay, I don't think any uh, car person would ever do that, but you know, why not? So that would be a different way. And as I mentioned before, there could be a, a, a Ferrari that someone, a visitor, could sit in and um, touch the steering wheel and pretend to drive. So there would be other ways of doing this um, exhibition, okay? And that, if you can imagine those differences, that helps reveal uh, the choices that have been made in the, the text that is in front of you. Okay, so um, I won't stop there for questions. <laughs> I'll keep going. I hope everything is okay. Um, all right, so for interactional meaning. So this is the second metafunction and we're talking here about social reality. So it's not so much about what a space is, um, but it's about how participants are positioned to interact with the space and its objects and its each other, okay? And there are a number of systems here which I'll come to in a moment. So this is one side of interactional meaning. And the other side of interactional meaning, which I won't go into today, but it is very interesting, is about how participants are made to feel in the space. And these terms binding and bonding come from Marie Stenglin's work, which I mentioned earlier. And we can also consider the modality of the space. And our previous speakers mentioned that this was kind of a, 
a more than real or an out of this world experience. And I think that's to do with the modality of the space. And it's not like a real racetrack at all or a dirty car or a dirty engine inside a car or anything like that. So we're going to look at these aspects. How do the participants interact with the space, its objects and each other? So um, these systems, uh, uh, yeah, so they each uh, are about a slightly different aspect. Contact is about uh, in particular, what the visitor can see and how they can see, you know, is everything open to view or is some things slightly hidden? Power is about the vertical access and things that are up high usually have a power over something that is lower down. Okay, so we have seen already that the pedestal is used to raise the car slightly above the viewer. Involvement is a little bit tricky, but it's a basically about whether the visitor approaches the cars or objects directly or indirectly. And um, social distance is about how close you can get. And control is about how free the visitor is to do what they want. Okay, so quite a few things there. If I go back to the language museum uh, in Sao Paulo, and uh, what they're doing with interaction on level two. Uh, in, in, the, the contact that visitors have, what they can see, and their involvement, how they can approach the exhibits, is somewhat reduced on this level, in, particularly in comparison to the first level with that highly interactive exhibit. Here on level two, the exhibits are fixed in place. They're kind of positioned behind glass, so perhaps they can be seen, but they can't quite be touched and so on. Social distance uh, on level two is increased a little in comparison to level one. Visitors can only get so close to the exhibits here. You know, you can sit right in front of it, but you probably shouldn't put your hands on it. Um, whereas on level one, everything can be touched. Control in terms of how free the visitor is, is increased in the level two space compared with level one. The, the paths are ostensibly open, but not particularly great in number. So the visitor has some freedom to move around this space, um, but not absolute freedom. And on, on level two here, the power of the institution is not particularly strongly asserted through the height. You can see the ceilings are uh, a little bit high, but not that high. Um, level one, the ceilings are actually very high. So there's not a lot of assertion of the power of the institution in that way, but it is evident in other ways. For example, through the formality of the exhibits, which indicates that this is you know, a proper or a conventional museum. Okay, so let's go back to Modena then and I uh, won't try the breakout groups this time, but I'll give you a couple of minutes to perhaps think about these variables. So um, it's like taking off a pair of glasses. So we're not thinking so much now about what the space is, what's in there and what's it for, and what's it doing, but we're thinking, how are we interacting with this space? All right, so we're putting on a different pair of glasses. So think about whether the visitor can see the cars, uh, how they approach the cars, whether the museum has asserted its authority, how close the visitor can get to the cars, and how free the visitor is to move around the space. Okay, so I'll just give a, a couple of minutes there. So please write down a few notes, and then I'll invite you to turn on your mic and camera and um, uh, give us your observations. Okay, thank you.
Okay, so uh, can I invite you back now and uh, ask again if anyone feels like they can make some observations about interactional meaning here, how you feel the visitor is positioned and um, what they can, how they can approach the space and so on. Yes. Did you want to speak again? Did, can you tell me your name? <laughs> My name is Denitza. Denitza. Okay. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Did you want to comment, Danica? If I may say something, I think that in this case um, we have to consider um, the affordances of the same objects which are actually in exposition and of course the contact that they create uh, or not create with the visitor uh, as to consider what is um, his or her interaction, contact with um, with the object inside of the particular space. So, um, firstly, uh, talking about, of course, um, um, the control, if we consider the control, um, I think that the idea of the museum is just to um, create a kind of a um, white cube, if I can um, define it like this, which means that actually it is a museum. This is not a racing track. You can watch, but you can't touch. And you can watch on a certain distance, which actually uh, shows that, um, uh, how can I say, the dynamics between visitor and object are exactly the same like in the Asian, the normal museums. So basically nothing has changed from this point of view. The same with the power. Uh, you can choose a different, um, a, a different ways to walk around because it's not, of course, just one way and you can follow it. And this is something new. But of course, um, you can choose uh, the, three the, the three dimensional um, attitude, and that's all. You can't go under it, on it, inside of it. So actually, you can't interact with that. Mm -hmm. So it still remains just an object and not an experience, just a product, but not a process. And um, if I can consider something, uh, when you are inside of the museum, you do have, okay, this track and you can go around, but uh, there are no chairs and you can't sit and you can't relax for a moment and just watch on a certain car or watch on all of them, okay? And this is important because the museum says, okay, you have to move all the time, you have to move. You have no time to stop or just a bit of minutes to stop and watch on the car. This is what actually I think is uh, the main commercial idea of the Ferrari. Uh, which uh, says, okay, this is a very luxury object. And the same about the, the curvy forms, okay? The curvy forms are something very sweet. Our mind considers them like something very sexy, very luxury, very, uh, how I can say, um, original, but not, never something very practical, okay? Because uh, mm -hmm. when we think about the practical use of things, they're never curvy, actually. Mm -hmm. the, how I can say, they're, they're more comfy when they're curvy, mm -hmm. but they're not very practical, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is always, uh, I think, connected with the commercial message of, of the Ferrari. You can't use this car every day. You can't use this car to go shopping, okay? And um, that's why I think that, I can't remember, could you just show one more time the slide with uh, the levels? Uh, give me. Uh, which slide? The, the, the previous one connected with the uh, interaction between the object and exactly this one, the involvement. The involvement, yeah. I think, is partial uh, yeah. because we actually don't have a complete immersion with the object. We can't touch mm. it, which, mm -hmm. which is, like I said previously, exactly the same situation like uh, a normal historical museum, okay? It's yeah. not like, for example, uh, the, the, the one that you show uh, with the language museum, where you can touch, where you can go in. We don't have the situation in the Ferrari Museum. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that this is actually the main limit of it. They do have a second part, which actually was the warehouse, the first warehouse of the Ferrari. And it's okay. a kind of an, uh, an, a virtual museum where you have documents and videos uh, but it's not quite immersive. It's more 
a documentary one, okay? It's like to see a doc on the television regarding flu. Hmm. Fantastic. Oh, Danica, thank you so much. That's really wonderful. So um, I, think, I think a really interesting thing you said there, um, in addition to the observations, was that in many ways it's like any museum in that um, you can't actually touch those objects. A visitor can look but not touch. And this is where the meta functions inform each other because then that says something about Ferrari as an entity, it says it's important enough to be in a museum. If they just let the visitor do anything, pull the car apart and rebuild it and bang it a bit with a hammer, then that would be an everyday object, you know, not this uh, luxurious supercar. Yeah, so really very, very interesting. Thank you. So I'll go back to sharing those slides. Can I add something, please? <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, Danielle. Yeah. Hello. 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 Yes. What would uh, you like to add? Uh, I've actually been to the museum. I, I went there twice and I, I'm pretty sure that at least in one of the two occasions there was a car, only one and just one single a car that people could could go in they could touch things they could open the doors and you know sit in you take a photo while they were sitting in a ferrari etc so okay. i was wondering if this single exception could be like an assertion of authority as in you're coming here you can't really touch the the cars we will let you just have one exception and you can go for it i mean you can have like sort of what it really feels like to sit in a Ferrari but I mean please remember that we're exclusive so it's like a sort of concession sort of thing yeah. if you know what I mean yeah. it's like yeah. that we're letting you have just one single experience because you've come all the way to the museum and you want to sort of have this sort of direct uh, experience so yes you can have it but it's only one it's an exception and you have to keep that in mind and another thing I would like to add is that you know, when you walk in uh, the museum, you are on a higher level than all the cars, and it's quite interesting. So the, I think that one of the functions, going back to the representation aspect, is also um, uh, choice, as in, when you walk in, or at least this is how I felt, especially because um, this museum pairs up with another Ferrari museum, which is in Maranello, where the actual factory is, and that museum is structured like rooms and you have to go from one room to the other and you can't sort of change the way you visit the museum whereas when you walk inside this building you get like an overview of all the cars that you have there and actually the most important one in terms of like the the fanciest the the rarest the most expensive is exactly in the in the lowest point of the building and you get like a slope uh, pathway to the left and a staircase mm -hmm. to the right and you really feel like like it's an open space you can really make your own visit the way you want to and you can choose where you want to go first and when you want to go next and I think that you know it's I think I thought I, I thought when I was there that was like, like a sort of a paradoxical contrast between the idea of being able to choose where to go so you can experience Ferraris the way you want to as in you can you can choose which one to look at first and so on. But then on the other hand, you have like the sort of exclusive feeling that we have already described many times. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Danielle. That's very interesting. Um, uh, what you were saying at the beginning about the, the paradox of um, uh, not being able to touch any of these cars and then there is one there. Yes, definitely all the variables of interaction change at that point then. Um, the visitor can become, uh, can decrease the social distance, become intimate with the space, with the object, etc. They have involvement and so on. So everything changes. So yes, that indicates the institution's uh, uh, literal power and their authority that it is their choice to make those options available or not available to the visitor. That's very interesting. And what you're saying about how it's laid out. Yes, well, I hope I can go there myself one day and see it because it sounds really interesting. And as you say, a little bit counterintuitive to how you might anticipate it would be designed. Yeah, so thank you again. That's really very helpful, very insightful. Okay, um, so let me go back to the slides. Yes, um, if uh, someone's saying hello, but I'm going to... Um, yeah, sorry, not yeah, yeah. Um, we, I need to move on because we need to finish very shortly. Um, 
and I imagine you all have busy days ahead of you. Otherwise, I could keep you here for a few hours, I think. But um, let's, uh, as I said, I will sh share the full slides afterwards. So we won't go through that. Um, so just really quickly, organisational meaning. So this is about bringing the parts together to make a meaningful whole and seeing how the parts flow or connect with each other. And, and uh, what Daniel was saying um, uh, just then perhaps points to this being a very interesting part of this museum. And we can also look at what stands out and what is backgrounded. So the key systems here are information value, which you may be familiar with from Crescent von Leeuwen's work, salience, what stands out, framing how things are separated or merged and navigation which overlaps with pathway and it's particularly important to keep the perspectives like the layers in mind here whether we're talking about the whole space or just one car we don't need to revisit that um, so in this one so i'm just going to give some points here uh, again, some of this might be, be a little bit wrong because I haven't been there, not fully aware of the layout in particular. But um, the whole space, it seems to me we've got a bit of a temporal flow. Certainly that seems to be what they're suggesting in the video, but the video may not be the same as the visitor's movement through the space. But in the, visit, visit, in the video, they started with the oldest cars and moved to, to the newest. So it's kind of a temporal flow from before to next and after and so on. Um, when we get to one particular car, the car standing on its pedestal or its plinth, the car is the nucleus and everything around it is marginal. So the additional bits of information, the visitor and so on, it's the car that's the focus. So salience, the whole space, perhaps the last car, Daniel there was just saying that the, the most exclusive one I think is at the bottom, right? That's very interesting and each, cluster of the car on the plinth, clearly the salience there is the car itself because it's up high, it's in the centre, it's shiny, it's symbolic of this luxury uh, super fast vehicle and so on. In the whole space the framing is present but weak, so empty space is used in between the cars to indicate that they are different and there are those little archways the visitor can walk through to signal you know a new area of geography and each cluster has some framing, the plinth separates the car from the user and so on. But um, the framing is not strong, there's no walls here, it's not separate rooms, it's one space. And there is navigation implied, although again Daniel was suggesting that there are some alternatives and at, at a particular car the visitor can move all around the car, they don't just see it from one side, um, so they can move all around it, but in interactional terms, we, we notice that on the whole, they can't go inside it. Okay, and again, we could imagine different ways that we could organise it. Okay, so um, uh, I'll stop sharing there. So that was a, a, a Ferrari speed through the last uh, elements there. There's not much time left for questions or, or comments. Um, I uh, will have readings to circulate as well. Okay, yeah, that's nice. Um, okay, so um, uh, if anyone has questions um, for the last few minutes, please turn on your microphone and camera now. And um, we are right on seven, so if you need to leave, um, I think uh, Marina will be okay if I say it's okay for you to leave <laughs> if they need to go. <laughs> But it's also okay for you to go on if you have, because we've had a number of technical hitches, so we can speak our time All right. for yes. a final yeah. discussion. If yes, and I'm sure yeah, that I, I'm, I am more than happy to to take <laughs> questions and comments, or to go backwards in the presentation if you want me to go back to a particular point and revisit that. Um, I'm happy to stay on, but if you would like to leave, then 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 um, you're welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Maria Sofia. Yeah, uh, I have a, just a very quick question, um, and I, but I have to make two points. Uh, the first is that I've never been to the Enzo Ferrari Museum, and then my background in the subject is very limited, so bear with me. 
uh, but my question is, when we are doing uh, exercises like the one we did before, where we saw the video, um, how can we make sure that our perception of the meaning of the stat space is not influenced by the video shot? Because for me, while I was looking at the video, I had a completely different interpretation from other people that have spoken so far. So for me, uh, the entire experience was very influenced by the video shots. And so I had uh, a feeling of a story being told that would develop both chronologically and geographically. Uh, so that was my interpretation. Mm -hmm. So if since in the time of COVID, we, we will probably <laughs> be forced to uh, do this kind of things through video and, you know, so in a socially distanced way. How can we make sure that we are interpreting the space correctly, so to speak? Mm, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Maria Sofia. That's a really important question. Um, uh, I, I think that goes back to rule number one, which is that you really can't analyze the space unless you've been there, you know. And as you say, the video, a video, a film, anything like that is a point of view, right? So we're almost uh, subjected to the point of view of the video maker. And of course, that one had sound with it playing, which I assume is probably not in the uh, environment in the museum. So in a way, the video will lead us astray. Yeah. So I think what I would say is if, if that is the only thing you have access to, then um, uh, do the analysis that you can. But you would just have to write that, you know, as I, I've said verbally here, perhaps um, uh, your assumptions will be wrong because you haven't been there. And um, the, the as earlier speakers who, who have been there, they're things that they can bring to the analysis that, that change our understanding of what the space is because they have the user's experience of the space. Yeah. So normally I wouldn't um, engage in an analysis um, uh, unless I've been there. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. Thank you. This is wonderful to hear because I continue to insist that the real presence in the museum space is the main one. It's exactly like to um, just to watch um, a website of the museum. I think that the video is basically the same thing. You just have a point of view. Yeah, you have a point of view. And, um, and I think that you can't activate a reading of, yeah. of, the, of the text, of the, of yeah. the original, if I can say. Yeah. Yeah. It's very challenging though, isn't it? Because, you know, most museums are moving towards uh, a strong um, web presence. And as Maria Sophia said, in relate in particularly in this COVID time, and which looks like it's going to last a long time, you know, the best that some museums can do, and we're very grateful that they can do this is to, you know, give us a video of an exhibition, you know, a virtual tour and so on. So, um, yeah, I guess then then what you can analyze is the video, <laughs> so to speak. But I agree, you know, it's it's not the same as being there. It's absolutely not. You have to you have to feel a space. You have to be there. You have to feel it. And I, I think what you say about a, a visitor activating the story is very important. You know, we all bring something different to the space as well. Our own point of view you know and we attend to the things that interest us and notice different things our as period eye. beg your pardon our period eye as michael baxendall just this yeah. concept of the period eye yeah every yeah. single person has its own yeah. vision of things yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I was wondering about, um, um, you said that we don't have um, separation of the space. We have one single space. Is this negative or positive for the text? Hmm. Uh, I don't think it's either negative or positive, but it just makes it a particular kind of text. And if the framing was done differently, it would make it a different text. So, um, uh, yeah, there the framing is is present so we can see that it's not like 20 cars all bunched together they're separated in a particular way and they're separated by the the empty space between them right but they're also unified by the consistency of the visual background the, all the white shiny surfaces and so on um, if they 
put the cars with, you know, a wall in between them, maybe a partial wall, which, which showed a strong separation. That's not better or worse, but it makes a different meaning. Yeah. Uh, if one of the cars was in a, in a completely different room, that's going to attribute some different meanings to that car. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Anything else? May I say a word? Yes, Federico. Okay. Um, my I have two questions in reality. The first is the challenge that the coronavirus is uh, bringing to um, to the to the development of museums, because you know uh, in many countries uh, it is still impossible to get a lot of visitors in museums. Is this risk of doing a complete online tour in museums a challenge to this approach of analysis of uh, spatial discourse analysis uh, or in some ways uh, it is still possible to develop a new approach considering that everything is going online and secondly uh, okay this uh, methodological approach is really objective uh, is very scientific but is somehow uh, our perception still influencing the way we analyze the space? Mm. Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> 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 so, so the, the first, uh, the first one, um, yeah, so, so the approach to spatial discourse analysis, you know, it comes out of an approach to language and an approach to images, predominantly still images. But that approach has also been used in relation to dynamic images and film and all sorts of other um, uh, modes of communication and also entities, you know, like hairstyles and so on. So there are um, core elements of this approach, like the understanding of metafunctions, for example, that you can apply to anything. So I think uh, the analysis is not challenged by the fact that museums might be going online, but the fact that museums are going online means you have to uh, do something other than, or in addition to spatial discourse analysis. So it might account for what's in the museum, but I think going online, you have to account for different things. So bring in the analysis of film, of video, of point of view, of editing and so on um, to fully understand that text. Yeah. So I, does that answer the first part of your question? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then the second one, is it still subjective? Yes, absolutely it is. Okay. So it's, mm, I, I wouldn't use the word scientific myself about this approach. I would say more systematic rather than scientific. So it's a, a fairly conscious approach to analysis and a structured approach. Um, it is highly subjective in many ways, but the way in which it's not subjective is that you must be able to argue for your analysis based on the explicit textual evidence, what you can see, what is physically there and so on. So I can't just say, oh, this little bit of the museum in the corner over there, that's the ideal bit, right? I have to relate that analysis to a particular feature in Crescent von Leeuwen's term, it's height on the vertical axis. It's nothing to do with a sort of a symbolic sense of ideal or whatever. Um, and I have to show that things in the museum are on a different height. Right? So you have to uh, connect it in concrete ways to the text and argue for your analysis based on that. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay, any more? Oh, just an observation, very fast one. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's just a question uh, regarding the perception. Actually, there are two levels. We do have the real features of the situation, the space, the objects, if, if it's on your right, on your left, if it's on up and down. So basically, you have to move, you have to watch around. And this is the first level, and this is completely objective. And then comes the second one of interpretation, which, of course, is based on your personal experience. 
and of your knowledge. Yeah, yeah, and, and of course, based on your theory, you know, you have a theory of how meaning is made, you know, um, so, so that is, you know, so I guess the description is, is uh, why I emphasize it's important to start with that there, because that is, in a way, the neutral, it, nothing is completely neutral, but let's just say, look, it's a big white space, it's kind of curvy, it's got these cars in it, and so on. Um, but then, yes, the analysis is bringing in your theory and your interpretation based on your theory. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's very important. Yeah. Okay. So, Marina, shall we stop there? Yes, okay. unless there's one more question. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I think, it, it, I think we must really thank you very much for giving us the extra time, a lot of input, a clear suggestion for the social program for the summer school next year. Hoping we can have our summer school, the social program will include a visit to the Ferrari Museum. <laughs> yeah. Then we can yeah. talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> then yeah. Ita will be with us, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> um, so thank you very much again. I apologize for uh, the, the technical problems. Oh, but, you do? Yeah, uh, yeah. We, um, you really gave us uh, a lot of suggestions and a lot of tools for analysis. Thank you very much, Louise. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for organizing it and thank you for being here. My apologies that I wasn't as adept with the technology as I thought I was ready to be. Neither um, was I. <laughs> and uh, perhaps the Ferrari Museum will be pleased when they get a flood of visitors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank All you right. very much then. All Thanks right. We'll be in touch. Everyone. Thank All you. Right. And I'll, I will send the slides. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'll share them with the participants. Great. Thanks. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.